Thirty years ago, CFRB was born. From a clear, small voice flashing upward through the uncluttered Ontario airwaves in the first weeks of 1927, this radio station grew to a mammoth of entertainment, information, and influence in Canadian life. But originally, a lone radio signal in the winter air was the outrider of things to come. Nine RB testing. <laughs> Nine RB testing. Nine RB testing. Sixteen minutes after midnight Eastern Standard Time, January the 29th, 1927. Yes, RB testing. That was all for the time, except curious letters in the newspapers. What is this RB testing? By February 19th of 27, most everyone knew about the new radio station designed and operated by the young electrical genius E.S. Ted Rogers, for already thousands of listeners enjoyed the reliable performance of his Rogers batteryless AC receiving set, which had revolutionized the medium. Radio as an industry was still in its infancy, and the jingling jazz bands played the theme songs of the Roaring Twenties. The golden age of sport was at its height, both in the States and Canada. Babe Ruth was still the king of SWAT. The dashing four horsemen of Notre Dame and Red Grange were everyday conversation, while a fearsome pack of tigers from Hamilton ruled our eastern Canadian gridiron. Brian Timmis, Dave Sprague, and all the rest. Hockey fans in 1927 were hearing of a young rushing defenseman called King Clancy with the Ottawa Senators of the NHL, and Howie Morenz, the Stratford streak, was still the scourge of the league. That was 30 years ago. Our personal values were very different then. We had a different appreciation of life itself. Money was still plentiful. Few of us dreamed that the worst depression of all time was just around the corner, waiting for the resounding crash which would lead us shakily into the early 30s. On Christmas morning, 1932, CFRB broadcast the first of many consecutive greetings from the ruling monarchs of the Empire and Commonwealth. Nervous and ailing, King George V, nevertheless spoke clearly from London. Through one of the marvels of modern science, I am enabled this Christmas day to speak to all my peoples throughout the empire. I take it as a good omen that wireless should have reached its present perfection at a time when the empire has been linked in closer union. For it offers us immense possibilities to make that union closer still. In the very months which saw the toppling stock markets hit the bottom, CFRB was moved to its present extensive quarters in Toronto. It was hard to be optimistic but the plans had been made, and the radio station relayed the tidings and tunes of the doleful thirties to the gigantic audiences of the time. Radio, by all measurements, was the ideal entertainment for a stricken nation. Then, in August 1934, CFRB itself was dramatically in trouble. A sudden flash fire broke out in the main control room in the early hours of the morning, and in minutes, the work of years of experimentation and research became a blackened hulk of useless scrap and red-hot iron. The present manager of the station, Lloyd Moore, recalls that situation. Like everyone present that night, I was called out of bed in the small hours and entered the control room, or what was left of it. Around me, smoke-blackened figures worked in the semi-darkness trying to retrieve at least a portion of that loss. The greatest concern among the station engineers was not at that moment the estimated damage to equipment, some $85,000, but the fact CFRB might not broadcast when sign-on time arrived. But as thousands of listeners tuned in at breakfast time, our signal swept out across Ontario, as always, thanks to the frantic struggles of our staff Bell telephone linemen and hydro workers. 
It was the closest call we have ever had. How the station managed to continue transmission without pause remains a triumph of engineering skill. Among the national diversions of the early 30s was the worldwide attention focused on Calendar, Ontario in May of 1934, the birthplace of the famed Dion Quintuplets. When the Quints were two years old, CFRB's announcer Dick McDougall with Dr. Alan Roy Defoe began a long series of broadcasts originating in Calendar and relayed to the entire Columbia Radio Network. Added to the economic burden of the average Canadian in the Depression 30s was a new element for worry. The Treaty of Versailles was a failure. Germany was arrogant again. Arrogant in the person of a new dictator in the world. Adolf Hitler may have created concern to the world at large, but to CFRB's colorful newscaster Jim Hunter, he was just another story in the day's news. Hunter, a genuine radio personality with a vast audience across Ontario, had firmly established his standing following coverage of the dramatic Moose River Mine disaster in Nova Scotia in 1936. Relayed to the outside world over a single telephone line, the rescue story of the three Toronto men trapped in the Moose River Mine took ten days of nerve-wracking work on the actual scene and equal hours of tireless reporting to satisfy the public demand for facts. Jim Hunter of CFRB began the story on the air and continued with little sleep until the rescue was complete. His listeners never forgot his efforts. Good news or bad, Jim Hunter's famed sign-on was ever the same, except for the day of the week. Good evening, everybody. Back in 1919, we made our first trip into the mining areas of northern Ontario. On our return to Toronto, we were invited to address a meeting and tell of our first impression. We couldn't help opening with the words, it's a land of rocks and Christmas trees. That was the compelling voice which helped carry the news burden through the frightening days of Munich, through Neville Chamberlain's tragic dealings with Hitler. But tragedy came quickly home to CFRB in 1939 with the sudden death of its founder, young Ted Rogers, the genius of communication. The official announcement was made by Harry Sedgwick. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with deep regret that I announce the death of Mr. Edward S. Rogers, the president of Rogers Majestic Corporation and of this station. As a tribute to him, CFRB will be off the air until five o'clock this afternoon following the playing of Handel's Largo. It is fitting that we should observe a period of silence during the funeral ceremonies of him who guided the destinies of CFRB from the very outset. Mr. Rogers was more than an executive head of this station. He was only 38 years old at his death. But from his earliest... Yes, Ted Rogers was gone. But his radio station carried on, faced now by momentous days. Most everyone felt war was possible, but not inevitable. Canadians shrugged off Hitler's threats and turned to welcome King George VI to Canada. King George and his queen charmed the Commonwealth with their devotion to duty tying the empire together once more following the dramatic abdication of Edward VIII. Rex Frost, longtime broadcaster for the station, covered the royal visit to Toronto in 1939. Mrs. Day and Mayor Day step out of their car, returning to the city hall from the official welcome at the North Toronto station. They're proceeding to the dais, of course, to extend again an official welcome 
from the specially erected platform in front of the Toronto City Hall. As George VI completed his Canadian tour and stood in the June sunlight of Halifax Harbour to say his farewell to Canada, he looked rested and fit. But it was the last time he was ever to see our country. Mr. Premier, and ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Premier, I'd like to thank you for the very warm welcome which has been given to the Queen and myself today by the province of Nova Scotia. Time has come for the Queen and myself to say goodbye to the people of Canada. You have given us a welcome of which the memory will always be dear to us. By the beginning of 1941, World War II was well underway. But as far as Canadians in general were concerned, it was still a distant affair, except for the 1st Canadian Division in England, the Royal Canadian Air Force forefront already in service, and the Naval Atlantic patrols, the country as a whole had yet to hear an authoritative call for total war effort. Then in Ottawa, on February 2nd of 41, Prime Minister Mackenzie King stepped to a microphone. I wish to make an appeal to every Canadian. It is an appeal to rally all our strength to save Christian civilization from disaster. There are many indications that within a very short while, the enemy will make a tremendous effort to destroy the British Commonwealth by a series of smashing blows of unprecedented severity. Total war will be waged in all its fury. Hitler has made his purpose clear. It will be a desperate race against the growing power and strength of the British Commonwealth, a strength augmented by steadily increasing supplies from the United States. We have heard a great deal about total war. Total war means an indiscriminate attack on every front by every means, however fiendish. It is war on sea, on land, and in the air, against armed forces and forts, warships and merchant ships. Practiced by the Nazis, as we have seen, it is war against homes, hospitals, schools, and churches. It is war on men, women, and children. It is war by shot, shell, fire, and poison gas. Its aim and purpose are total destruction. This is the war with which Britain is face to face. We would soon know all its horrors if the enemy could reach us. Between this continent and that attack, Britain stands as the first line of defense. That was it. Mobilization for a total war effort. After that, few of us had little time for anything but the war. Radio station CFRB in those years, like all communications, often operated with skeleton staff, while news became ever more demanding. Nevertheless, the station still found time to acknowledge a notable birthday. Closed away from the bustling nation at war, living out his useful years in the quiet of his Toronto home, as Chancellor of Toronto's University and former Chief Justice of Ontario, Sir William Mulock celebrated his 100th birthday by speaking to a CFRB reporter. It was hard to realize that the white-bearded old gentleman had been a boy of seven when Queen Victoria came to the throne, was a youth of 19 years, when General Stonewall Jackson fell at Chancellorsville in America's Civil War and was only 23 years of age at Confederation. Nevertheless, Sir William Mulock's recorded words were typical of his wry sense of humor. I'm not in the habit of looking back. 
I'll leave that till I get old. But I will say this. I've seen tremendous changes in my time. When I was a boy, there was no Dominion of Canada. We had no railways, no streetcars, no automobiles, no aeroplanes. There was no radio, no electric lights, no motion pictures. Russia's dictator Joseph Stalin was not the only person waiting anxiously for the opening of the Second Front in Europe in 1944. With the coming of spring, Ontarians at home tuned in their radios each morning with an expectant ear. The invasion had to come soon, and they knew it. The electrifying news flash came on the morning of June 6th. A full-scale armada had reached the French coast. Thousands of troops had stormed the beaches of Normandy. Among the voices heard that day was that of General Bernard Montgomery. I want every soldier to know that I have complete confidence in the successful outcome of the operations that we are now about to begin. With stout heart and with enthusiasm for the contest, let us go forward to victory. By the following springtime, Canadians and the free world had reached another stage of expectancy. Hitler's Wehrmacht was crumbling before the surging allies, hemmed in by the enraged soldiers of the world. By May 1945, Hitler was dead by his own hand, and the Allied generals were broadcasting to their respective countries. The commander of the 1st Canadian Army, Lieutenant General Quirer, spoke from Europe. Victory Day, at long last, has arrived. The business we Canadians came over here to do is virtually finished. There will yet be quite a lot of tidying up to complete, but the military might of Hitler's Germany is a horror of the past. The war over. Ontario and CFRB turned to the job of rehabilitation. In that transitional period, one fact became crystal clear. Our old world was gone. With the bombings at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the atomic age had dawned in the smoke and devastation of the Japanese cities. But accounts remained unsettled with the remnants of the Nazi hierarchy. A world saturated with revenge nevertheless sat stunned with surprise as Hitler's henchmen pleaded not guilty at the Nuremberg war crimes trials in November 1945. Particularly ear-catching was Hermann Goering's stout denial at the microphone. Denied the privilege of a statement, Goering, thinner and older, ignored the judge's ruling, thumped up to the microphone, and eventually had to be silenced by the judge's gavel. Before I ask the question of the Gerichtshofes, beantworte, ob ich mich schuldig oder nicht schuldig bekenne. Toronto received a visitor on December 6, 1945. A tall, rugged appearing gentleman strolled into CFRB and sat down to talk in one of the studios. Jack Dempsey, the old Manasseh Mahler, was still enjoying the immense popularity he had gained almost 20 years before. Widely hated while champion, Dempsey swept to world affection after his defeat by Gene Tunney for the heavyweight title. Well, naturally, I think, uh, Wes, every fighter has one ambition, and that's to be champion. When I won the title from Jess Willard, that was my great day, or my big day, I should say, because it was one ambition, and when I got to be champion, that was fine. You know, it, it's not so easy to, to or not too hard to win the title, but it's awfully hard to keep it. But the, the outstanding day in my career as a fighter was the day that they crowned me champion out of Toledo way back in 1919. Those of us who perhaps doubted the advent of the atomic age had only to listen to our radios on June 30th, 1946. How would the bomb affect soldiers of the line? That was the question to be answered while 10,000 troops lay in slit trench protection just 10 miles from the scene of the detonation. Four, three, two, one.
The big news story in the late months of 1947 was the wedding of Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip of Greece. In the vast pomp and unnatural stillness of Westminster Abbey on November 20th, it was barely possible to hear the royal vows. Take thee, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary. Take thee, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary. To my wedded wife. My wedded wife. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. Take thee, Philip. Take thee, Philip. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. CFRB's listeners were brought up to date by Claire Wallace, right on the scene of the colorful pageant. Enthusiasm was ever the trademark of this broadcaster. Well, some dressed for the occasion, Al. Many wore uniforms. The majority of men were in dark business suits. Most colorful were foreign visitors, Arabians, Chinese, Indians, Greeks, in unusual garb. Prime Minister Athley slipped quietly in church and down the aisle so quickly hardly anyone noticed him. Mr. Churchill made a real entrance, accompanied by his attractive wife, and as though greeting royalty, everyone in the Abbey stood up for him. In fact, Churchill and Queen Mary are such prime favorites that they almost stole the show. <laughs> <laughs> they say that a good sports fan cannot remember his wedding anniversary half so readily as the date of a heavyweight championship fight. This contest found the brown bomber Joe Lewis still master of his fists as the amazing Jersey Joe Walcott fought to stall off the inevitable end. The date, June 25th, 1948. And then Walcott fights back with a left and a right to the jaw. He misses the right, a left hook to the head. Lewis belts him with a right and a left to the jaw. And Walcott is down. Walcott is down. We're trying to pick up the count. We can't hear the count. Walcott is trying to get up. He's on his knees. I don't know. Nine. No, no, it is all over. Here's the official announcement. Attention, please. The time, two minutes, 56 seconds of the 11th round. The winner and still heavyweight champion of the world, Joe Lewis. Some of the most heartbreaking sights of the late 1940s were odd glimpses of the great Babe Ruth in newsreels or his rare attendance at public gatherings. Hounded to his death by cancer of the throat, the great Bambino nevertheless fought back with his old courage. Ruth even consented to a radio appearance, although speaking was torture. The subject, how to play right field, was addressed to the youngsters who idolized him. That was all the Bambino wanted to know. Well, the weather conditions means an awful lot. You can always look up. In most ballparks always have flags up there. They're waving and waving and waving, different pennant flags, which shows you which way the wind's blowing. And you can play that player accordingly. And then you also got to watch the pitcher. The pitcher can help you out an awful lot. He can pitch according to the way you play. If he pitches on the outside and you're playing left field, the man hits the ball to right field is going to make the outfielder look very bad. Kate Aiken possesses the best-known feminine voice in Canada. For over 20 years, Mrs. A has broadcast daily over CFRB. Her range of subjects covers the interests of womankind. For example, this real-life experience on the Austrian border last year. Do you have children 10 or 12 years old in your house? Here were two boys. We stood, black darkness, blacked out, waiting for the rustle through the grass that would mean an escaping refugee. Instead of the rustle, a whimper. And then up through the marsh grass came two youngsters, one 10, one 12. They had been aided to the border by their parents because the age of, let's say, deportation to Siberia for boys is from 12 to 20, from girls 14 to 22. The boys have been brought to the border by their parents and then crept over. There they were surprised by a guard and with their two bare hands, with no gun, no anything except the strength of their baby hands, 
They choked the guard to death. Would you like that to happen to a son of yours? The late 1940s were pretty much a case of outguessing the Russians as far as international policies were concerned. The free world burned out several top statesmen out-talking the men of the Kremlin. But world peace was a teetering dream which, periodically, became a nightmare. CFRB knew personal sorrow in 1949 when the likable Scotsman Jim Hunter, the talking reporter, died. His long years of public service became the topic of conversation as thousands of telegrams and letters deluged the station. The Moose River mine disaster and the other great stories which he had made his own became the epitaph of the great broadcaster. John Collingwood Reed put our sorrow into words. For the thousands who have been accustomed to listen to this station at this time, there is a sad disappointment in store. You will miss the cheery, good Monday evening, everybody, and the happy hunting song which has for more years than most of us care to remember heralded the evening news, delivered by your talking reporter. Jim Hunter died this morning after a brief illness. He hadn't been feeling too well for some... With the coming of the 50s, broadcasting became even more involved with the transmission of sport. Canadian football became as imperative as hockey, and the two seasons began to overlap. The legendary figures of Canadian sport were now graying men, no longer capable of flashing feats on the ice or gridiron. But their visits to the radio station were events to be remembered. On March 3rd, 1951, the unique athlete, Newsy Lalonde, appeared on a sports interview. Lalonde had been voted the greatest lacrosse player of the first 50 years of the century, and remained one of the outstanding hockey players of all time. Well, as a player, you were never classed as any uh, Lady Bing trophy winner, Newsy. Is uh, hockey as tough today as it was then? Well, I, I know I don't think hockey is as tough today as it was then. In fact, I think it's much cleaner than it was in the olden days. The, uh, the protection is, is all for the player today, but in our days, why... Uh, if you got two minutes for giving a man a couple of stitches, why, that was all you would get. The triumphant Canadian visit in 1951 of Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip belongs among the happiest memories of the nation. Canadians, however, had to wait until the royal couple returned to London to hear the princess's personal reaction. She spoke from London's Guild Hall in November 1951. Canada is indeed a land where enterprise can flourish and where industry will be rewarded, a land that deserves people of sterling quality. I hope that people from the United Kingdom will continue to go out, as they have in the past, to make their life beside the fine men and women who form the nation of Canada as it is today. I am sure that nowhere under the sun could one find a land more full of hope, of happiness, and of fine, loyal, generous-hearted people. I do not believe one can return from Canada without a new sense of faith in the progress of mankind, for none of the doubts, disillusions, nor difficulties that face us on this troubled continent are going to hold back the Canadians they are going to ensure for themselves the survival of all those things for which we have fought in this country through the ages and which we treasure. Justice, liberty, opportunity for all, and kindliness between man and man. Thanks principally to football and the extensive use of American talent in the Big Four and Western Conference Leagues, the entire structure of Canadian sport was being influenced by change in the early 1950s. The game of hockey was solely maintained by Canadian players on both sides of the international border. Our International League baseball clubs were staffed exclusively by American ball players, while Canadian professional football was a 50-50 proposition as far as playing talent was concerned. With these facts in mind, it was little wonder excitement ran high when the incomparable Jim Thorpe 
the Carlisle Indian, visited CFRB while a guest of honor of Canada's writers and broadcasters. Thorpe, voted the greatest athlete in the history of sport, spoke cheerily in Toronto, but within a year, his voice was still forever. Well, yes, it was. It was the greatest thrill that I ever had in my athletic career, I think. Well, in all your great athletic career, what one sports achievement was your greatest, do you think? Well, I think that was the greatest, uh, winning the two all-round events in the decathlon and the pentathlon and the Olympic Games of 1912 at Stockholm, Sweden. Well, just what did you do to win those events? How many events did you take well, part I in? Well, I won 11 out of the 15, and there was 15, there was 10 in the decathlon and 5 in the pentathlon. I won the two all-around events that's never been duplicated since. And I don't think ever will be, for that matter, but how many events did you have in one day, for instance? Well, I had five in the pentathlon, and uh, we had three days run off the decathlon, and three in one day, and three the next, and four in the last. What were some of the events in that? Well, it uh, takes in all of your, uh, well, your dual meets of today outside of your long-distance run, takes in the sprints, the hurdles, and all your field events, like the broad jump, the high jump, the shot put, and the pole vault, and the discus, and the javelin, and the hammer throw, and, uh, well, you had your hurdles and your sprints, and and up to the 1,500-meter run. If there'd been anything else, they'd have had them in there, too, is that I right? I suppose so, yes. Well, what did you do after those three days? Go out for a walk for some exercise? <laughs> <laughs> On March 31st, 1953, CFRB's audience heard from London the funeral service of the most regal figure in the House of Windsor. The Dowager Queen Mary was dead. For as much as it hath pleased Almighty God of his great mercy to take unto himself the soul of our dear sister here departed, we therefore commit her body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be like unto his glorious body, according to the mighty working whereby he is able to subdue all things to himself. Ever since the memorable farewell at Yankee Stadium when Lou Gehrig left baseball, the retirement of prominent athletes has become a spectacle for sport fans. And that's how it was on Saturday, November 14, 1953, when Joe Kroll hung up his football boots for the last time. Varsity Stadium was crowded. Before the big league game got underway, Joe Kroll, who had sparked the Argonauts to three gray cups in the middle 40s, was having his big day. A new car and dozens of other gifts affected the quiet player. He had an affected moment at the microphone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It certainly is a, a, a great thrill and a great honor for me to have been singled out for this tremendous tribute. I only hope I've been worthy of it. CFRB has always been fortunate in the personalities surrounding this station. Jim Hunter, Reed, Aiken, and the rest have added their own particular glamour to the proceedings. Few Canadian newscasters, however, possess the colourful language command, the humorous approach, and the penetrating logic of Gordon Sinclair. Anybody who's read the book, My Six Convicts, knows that the inmates of big penitentiaries are frequently examined by what they choose to call bug doctors. These psychiatrists go in to find a variety of angles, such as what makes criminals do it, and so on. And here we go again. A team of psychiatrists is now starting to prowl through the corridors of Sing Sing to study recidivism. What do you mean you don't know what recidivism is? You don't? Why, shucks, fellas, that means backsliding. The bug doctor now wants to learn why a criminal who has done one long term back of the bars, follows the same behavior pattern, and winds up in the same spot again. And a fellow named Dr. Samuel Dunoff, the chief bug doctor, 
says he may have a new drug that'll bring recidivism under control. Boy, I'm telling you, they got new drugs now for everything except growing hair. Ever since Marilyn Bell swam Lake Ontario, the art of distance swimming has dominated all other summertime sports in Canada. The names of Bell, Gus Ryder, and Lumsden have stood for stamina and courage, while vaunted water distance has faded before their determination. In August 1956, Marilyn Bell returned from her successful attempt to swim Juan de Fuca Strait in British Columbia. Well, I can't remember the end of the lake swim, but I felt about the same when I uh, finished this one as I did when I finished the channel. I, w I wasn't, t I mean, I was a little tired, you know, but I was able to walk. Well, of course, the uh, future plans of swimming, of course, uh, professionally are always more or less in doubt, but that would depend on Marilyn's studies and uh, Marilyn herself. For over two decades, CFRB's feminine listeners have followed the culinary suggestions of the internationally known expert, Anne Adam. In any country my home crafters or I have visited, we've met one leading question. What is Canada's national dish? I have often wished there were one. Certainly, we have a remarkable choice. The world of music at CFRB has always been in the forefront of consideration. The broadcasting trades thought so, too, when, in addition to the many discoveries credited to this station, Shirley Harmer, George Murray, and Joan Fairfax, and the long-time service of organist Ruby Ramsey Rouse, CFRB received the Beaver Award for its program, Canadians All, dedicated to the cause of new Canadians, produced by Wishart Campbell. No, no, gentlemen, let's attack together. A little more punch. Are you ready in the booth there, Don? Okay, fellas, let's have it now. <laughs> Golfer Marlene Stewart of Font Hill, Ontario, voted the outstanding golfer on the distaff side many times in Ontario, finally won international recognition when she won the United States Women's Amateur in September 1956. She spoke to sports director Wes McKnight from Indianapolis. Now, what are your plans now? I imagine you've won just about everything. Are you going to take a little rest? You've been playing a lot of golf this summer. Oh, I sure am. It's, <laughs> I, I just don't care now if I ever win anything again. This is the one I really wanted to win most of all. Well, I know it is. It won the British, you've won uh, the American, you've won the Canadian several times. It's a tremendous achievement, Marlene, and I know you must be pretty tired after a week. Now, when are you coming home? I'm coming home tomorrow. I'll be home tomorrow night. Well, that's fine. We hope you see you when you get up here. And again, congratulations from everybody in Canada. You've done a tremendous job of representing uh, this country in, uh, in golf, and boy, we're proud of you. Oh, thank you, Wes. <laughs> okay, we'll see you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. In November 1956, came the most serious rift in the history of the British Commonwealth, when Britain and France entered Egypt to protect their interests in the Suez Canal. The incident did not find unanimous approval across the world. Canada had difficulty balancing between her traditional loyalty and her American affiliation. CFRB carried Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent's policy speech of the time. The Canadian government regrets that Israel proceeded last week to use force against Egypt, although we recognize that Egypt has been subject to grave threats and provocations during the last few years. Though we recognize the vital importance of the canal to the economic life and international responsibilities of the United Kingdom and France, we could not but regret also that at a time when the United Nations Security Council was seized of the matter, the United Kingdom and France felt it necessary to intervene with force on their own responsibility. As expected, President Dwight Eisenhower carried his lagging Republican Party back into power in November 56, and Ike was pleased when he stepped to the microphone. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice President, my very good friends in this audience and everywhere in the United States, to whatever areas my voice reaches, this is a solemn moment. The only thing I should like to say about this campaign is this. 
It is a very heartwarming experience to know that your labors, your efforts of four years have achieved that level where they are approved by the United States of America in a vote. It's appropriate here, we believe, to end this pageant of service of a radio station to its listeners with the voice of Queen Elizabeth. Her grandfather began the now traditional Christmas messages to the Empire and Commonwealth, and CFRB has relayed the holiday sentiments from Sandringham to the far reaches of Ontario and beyond for over two decades. The Queen. Let us remember those who, like the Holy Family before them, have been driven from their homes by war or violence. We call them refugees. Let us give them a true refuge. Let us see that for them and their children, there is room at the inn.